We're just also happy for you to be here. Um, just for some context, everyone has been invited to watch a couple of different videos which introduce uh, Bernardo's basic approach. So kind of how he refutes materialism um, and his basic model of uh, idealism that he has. And uh, yeah, my understanding is you've arrived to very similar conclusions to Bernardo, but via slightly different and perhaps more experiential approach. And um, just over to you, if you're happy to guide a little contemplation that gives people a taste of what that is, and then we can go into a conversation on that. Yes, okay. So let, let me follow on directly from that, Amir. Um, I haven't come prepared with anything, but just to share with you a little bit of my experiential approach, how I've come to arrive um, via introspection at the same conclusions that um, Bernardo has arrived at. And I'll start by way of um, an analogy. Uh, everything that, uh, all the objects and characters that appear in a movie uh, derive their reality, relatively speaking, of course, from the single screen. And likewise, I would suggest that all the objects and animals and people that we experience in nature derive their seemingly independent existence from a single reality, which uh, ultimately cannot be named. And just as the just as the screen never appears as an object in the movie, and yet it is all there is to the movie, Likewise, the ultimate reality of the universe never appears as an object in the universe, although it is all there is to the universe. So it is sometimes said that reality lies behind the multiplicity and diversity of appearances and is concealed by them, that reality is somehow hidden behind the world. This is like saying, this would be the equivalent in our analogy of saying that the screen lies behind the movie and is hidden by it. The screen obviously doesn't lie behind the movie nor is it hidden by the movie, because all there is to the movie is the screen. Not only is the screen, does the screen not lie behind the movie and is not concealed by it, it shines as the movie, it appears as the movie. So what is it that makes it seem that the screen is not being perceived it is that our belief that the landscape in the movie is real in its own right. If we believe that the landscape in the movie is real in its own right, then we will believe that the landscape veils or conceals the screen. We will believe that the reality of the movie lies somehow behind the movie and is hidden by it. Likewise, the reason we think that the reality of the universe is hidden behind the universe and is concealed by it is only because we believe that the objects that appear to us as the universe are real in their own right. If we believe that the objects that appear to us as the universe are real in their own right, then we will believe that the 
their reality is concealed behind them and is obscured by them. Of course, the objects that appear to us in the form of the universe do not obscure their reality because all there is to those objects is their reality. Not only does the universe not conceal its re reality, it shines with it. The universe is an appearance of that reality. So, we might ask the question then, how is it possible for us to know the nature of reality if our only access to the universe is via perception? If all we know of the universe through perception and conception, through perceptions and thoughts, are a multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves, how is it ever possible to know the reality of the universe? Indeed, it would not be possible to know the reality of the universe if our only access to it was through perception and thought. However, there is one aspect one element of the universe that we have direct, unmediated access to. When I say unmediated, I mean we have access to it through a channel that is n does not go through perception or thought, and that is our knowledge of ourself. Our knowledge of ourself is the only knowledge there is that is not mediated through thought or perception. And therefore it is the only channel through which we have direct, unmediated access to the reality of the universe. And it is for this reason that self-knowledge stands at the heart of all the great religious and spiritual traditions. And I would go further and suggest that any scientist or philosopher who wants to know the ultimate nature of the universe must sooner or later end up investigating the ultimate nature of their self, the essential nature of their self. So, how do we go about investigating the essential nature of ourself? The essential nature of anything is the aspect of that thing that cannot be removed from it. So, one way to make this experiential investigation into the essential nature of ourself would be to remove, in fact we don't need to remove, it would be sufficient to imagine removing everything from us that is not essential to us. So I suggest we let's just embark, do this investigation for a few minutes, we won't go into too much detail, but start by closing your eyes. That removes one element of our experience, namely sights. And just imagine removing every element of your experience that is not essential to you. Sights, sounds, tastes, textures, smells, Images, memories, emotions, thoughts.
just imagine discarding any element of your experience that is not essential to you. One way to find out whether or not an experience is essential to us would be, uh, would be this, any experience that starts and stops, that appears and disappears is not essential to us. So any experience that you have ever had that begins, exists for a while and comes to an end cannot be essential to us. If it were essential to us, it would not come to an end. So in your imagination, remove everything from yourself that can be removed. Trace your way back through the layers of your experience. And then ask yourself the question, when everything can, that can be removed from me has been removed from me, what remains? And, and don't do this experiment philosophically, do it experientially. It's like undressing at night. We take off everything that can be taken off. What remains? Now, of course, later on in our conversation, we will give that which remains a, a name. We'll have to name it in order to speak of it. But don't allow yourself to give it a name yet. Whatever it is that remains is the essential, irreducible essence of our self. And whatever the essential nature of our self, it must be the essential nature of the universe of which we as apparently separate entities are a part in the same way that to investigate any any object in a movie it is sufficient to investigate, relatively speaking, of course, going back to my analogy, it is sufficient to investigate any object in a movie to discover its reality, the screen. And that screen must be the reality of all the objects in the movie, likewise. It is only necessary to investigate the essential nature of our self in order to know the essential nature of the universe. In fact, I would suggest the only way to know experientially the essential nature of the universe is to know the essential nature of oneself. Because our knowledge of ourself is the only knowledge that is not mediated through thought and perception.
therefore the key. The golden key to this discovery of the ultimate nature of reality is this investigation into the ultimate nature of ourself. And it is for this reason that the words know thyself were carved above the entrance of the tempo, temple of Apollo in Delphi and stand as such at the dawn of Western civilization. And I would suggest that at this hour of our civilization, this recognition of the essential nature of our self, and therefore the recognition of the essential nature of all people, all animals and all things, has perhaps never been more important than it is now. So that was just a very brief experiential introduction to this uh, investigation into the nature of reality that I know you have been exploring with Bernardo in, in, in this course. Brilliant. Thank you, Rufet. So um, I'm hoping anyone new to this approach will at least get a taste of, of um, the direction it goes or the invitation that it proposes. And uh, many of the questions that came through revolve around um, the curiosity of, of knowing that the two of you, um, hello, Bernardo, welcome. I haven't said hello yet. Uh, everybody. Hi, Rupert. Yeah, that you converge on many points. Um, and there's so much to learn or so many distinctions or greater understanding can arise sometimes by hearing where, where two different approaches are slightly different then both can be perhaps understood even more deeply. But um, yeah, you know, with either of you starting, perhaps it would be great to hear where you, a summary of, of where you feel you're strongly aligned and, and where, you, where your opinions diverge. And, and I think that will give a, a wider context for the other questions that will come forward. Do you want to give it a shot, a shot uh, Rupert? I think that we are um, aligned on pretty well everything, with the possible exception of uh, one, one point. And Bernardo, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you would say that uh, the ultimate nature of reality, let, let's, let's name it now, consciousness. Uh, both Bernardo and I are, are agreed about that. I think you would say, correct me if I'm wrong, Bernardo, that, that consciousness is not inherently self-aware. And I would suggest that it is. That's the only discrepancy I've ever been able to find between Bernardo's approach in mine. Yes, we had a um, discussion about this uh, accompanied by a good wine once. Yes, um, yes. It, it's it's probably impossible to to resolve this because we clearly are self-aware. Um, so it, it it's probably not something that we that the audience of this course might be expecting you know some experiment to resolve it it 
it. <laughs> no experiment is going to resolve it. Um, I think ultimately, um, Rupert is uh, is a lot more driven by a form of wisdom, uh, introspective wisdom, uh, than I am. Um, I come at this from a more conceptual perspective, and from a conceptual perspective, I am inclined, indeed, to think of self-awareness or metacognition uh, as an evolved capacity of consciousness. Of course, it has always been one of the potentials of con consciousness, but I think of it as something that has evolved through life uh, and not something that was already manifest in the very beginning. Um, and I clearly sense from you that you, you, you intuit, you sense, uh, you feel that it is primordial. It's been there all along. Yes, yes. But I would almost say this is in such an ancillary difference compared to everything else. Yes, I don't think there are any uh, valuable implications to our different view. That, that, that there are implications to the view, that there are profound implications in terms of our lives as individuals and as a society to the, the, the view that we share. But this uh, small difference, I don't think it has profound implications. In other words, the implications of each of our views is, are, are the same, irrespective of this small discrepancy. So it, it's a philosophical point, but not really uh, doesn't have experiential implications. No, I wonder if it's worth um, just spending a moment. So there's some questions coming through and, and there's some other questions about that uh, small difference. But I wonder if it's worth, because what is maybe more clearly different is your approaches. So you've said um, yes. one is yes. more introspective and one, um, but it's interesting, you know, your friends and you respect each other's approaches. So it'd be, it'd be great to hear what you value in each other's, what you see as the difference and why you've chosen your approach. And what you see the value in the other approach, the, the more introspective approach versus the more conceptual approach. Because I think that, that will also give a bit of context to anyone that is more familiar with one than the other. Because there are people here, I think, who've come to lots of your workshops, Rupert, and perhaps are coming uh, to hear from Bernardo for the first time as well. And, okay. and for context for anyone who hasn't been, for Bernardo's workshops, I think I've done 20, 20 out or maybe 50 hours with you by now, Bernardo, and, and not once has he invited us to close our eyes. So <laughs> that, <laughs> might, that might give you a little indication of the, of the difference. Well, I'm obviously very, very familiar with Bernardo's approach. So the meditate, when you asked me to do a meditation this evening, I, I specifically did a meditation that I felt was a very close. It was, it was like an ex I wanted to take you on an experiential pathway that runs parallel to a philosophical pathway that Bernardo would take so that my meditation was, it was very close uh, or be more experiential than philosophical to a pathway that Bernardo might take. So I, I wanted to, 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 to weave, weave the two approaches together. Um, I didn't really just to, answer your question I mean why did I why did I take this experiential approach rather than philosophical it wasn't a choice it was just the way I the, the way um, the way this investigation first first came to me it, it was um, I wasn't I wasn't motivated by the question what is the nature of reality I was more motivated by the question um, how can I get rid of my suffering that took me on an experiential pathway, which later um, uh, initiated my philosophical interest. So I was uh, I started with this experiential approach, and and then only later became interested in its philosophical implications. I, I go on. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Um that the introspective path, it is the golden path. It is the only one that is truly transformative. A purely philosophical path, if you don't explore it further uh, from an introspective perspective, it stays in the head as a, a conceptual game. 
and you can convince yourself logically that certain things are true, but you are not actually acquainted with that truth. Um, it's like knowing where Rome is, you can point the way and you know it's there, but you have never been there. That's the philosophical approach. Um, so we might ask, why do I do it then? Uh, I do it because I don't have a choice. Um, but also I try to validate the effort I make um, by paying attention to a specific group of people, people more or less like me, that do not allow themselves to open up to the introspective path unless and until they have some kind of conceptual model that validates that, that introspective path. If, if the head doesn't allow the heart to have the experience by direct acquaintance, then in those people, the heart doesn't get there. Uh, the, the, the brain is the bouncer of the heart. Um, so I, I see some meaning in, in what I do in the sense that uh, if I can help those people give themselves intellectual permission to open up to a direct acquaintance with the truth, um, then I think we will have made a step forward. And we live in a society that is unfortunately dominated by concepts. Uh, and it's this, this internet society, this vast communication society, it's driven by language and by conceptual articulations of everything with replaced reality uh, with a tiling of concepts. Um, so I think what I do has a, a role to play, but uh, I am keenly aware of how small that uh, role actually is in the context of trying to help people transform their lives. Can I just add something to that, Bernardo? I, I, I understand that, that you're your, your approach, your, 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 your speaking um, mainly, or perhaps that's changing now, but you, until recently you've been speaking mainly to people who wouldn't otherwise be interested in these ideas, as you say, that their, that their head prevents them from being um, open at an experiential level. But I think what, what, you're, you, what you're doing is also having an impact on um, people, perhaps more the kinds of people that I speak to, namely the people that, that um, are not so defended against it, this path of introspection. Because even those of us that take the path of introspection, the, our minds are still uh, raise objections at every corner. And so it's that the, the head is not just the bouncer of the heart in those people that are not open to the way of introspection, even those people who are deeply involved in um, introspection, um, find that they that their minds raise objections, which prevent them going deeper into their experiential investigation. And I feel that the work you're doing is making a very um, significant contribution to those people as well as those that are um, not yet uh, have not yet embarked on the path of introspection. And there is something you told me uh, three years ago, maybe maybe even more, and you said uh, this is going to happen to you, and uh, and it, it is happening for the first yes. time. I have been noticing it that if you are so planted in the world of idealism as a, as a conceptual narrative um, and you see the in, the out, the evidence and the logic for it, at some point without your noticing it, it sinks in yes, and it starts yeah. having a direct experiential impact uh, uh, on, on you. And uh, it was only the past year or two that I started noticing, wow, this, uh, this is yes. actually happening. Um, I didn't expect it. Uh, I didn't even dare to hope for it. Uh, but it is happening. And then um, it's not always nice uh, you know, to crack yourself open to empathy in a world in, in the world in which we live and given our present geopolitical situation it can be quite distressing. Um, but it, but it does have that effect. I mean, uh, our attempts to separate things between introspection and, and yeah. reasoning, they are epistemic it, and artificial. Exactly. <laughs> yes. 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 So I can I can I can 
recently I can feel certain things directly, like with a, with a, the, a quality of, of obviousness, of self-evidence that does not require a conceptual articulation to, to be justified. Um, and it started striking me. Um, it's a story. Since you're here, it's a, it's a very short story. Uh, give me two minutes. I was watching with my partner um, a, a series on Prime, I think, Amazon Prime, Castle Rock, which is based on the work of Stephen King. Um, and there was, it, it, it's silly in some ways, but it's, there, there are sillier things out there. Um, but there was this, this, this fictional story in which uh, uh, spirits from the past would sort of populate a living body of the present. So would push away the host personality to the back of the mind and, and that other ego would take over. But uh, it would take over, but still have the memories of the host personality. So the inv invading ego would, would remember the memories of the host personality from a first person perspective, but it knew that it was not the host personality. And then I started thinking, you know, let's, let's go further in this. You remember the memories of that other personality. You see the world from the eyes of that other personality, but you're still you. Now you go further. Now you have the skills of the other personality. Now you have the tastes and dispositions of that other personality. And now you begin to forget your own memories and you begin to forget your own tastes and disposition. Did anything change about what you actually are other than the contents of your mind? No, but it gets to a point where you are the other um, while still being yourself. And, and it's, it was striking to me that uh, you just needed to to push that line of fiction a little bit further for people to understand what's happening. Yes. Because that is what's happening right now. Thank you. you think you're you because you're watching the world through those eyes and you have the memories you have and you don't remember anything else. So you think you are this person, <laughs> uh, but it's actually the same you watching the world from behind my eyes and behind my cat's eyes and having everybody else's memories. It's the same subject, the same field of subjectivity. Yeah. It's so obvious, it's so evident. It's amazing how difficult we have made it to see because of culture. That's a beautiful analogy. I was just thinking before you, you started on that about a, a difference, another difference between our approaches that it only just came clearly into focus while you were speaking that you're, in a way, your, your intellect has carved a, a pathway uh, through which you, uh, so your intellect carved a pathway through the forest and you are now following that pathway experientially. I, uh, through introspection, through experience, I carved the same pathway through the forest and then my intellect had to follow afterwards. Uh -huh. so it's, but it's the same pathway. It is, it is. And it's becoming more and more evident. Yes. I, I believe, I always believed what you used to tell me, but uh, now I know, <laughs> yes. if you know what I mean. I mean, I'm not all the way there, <laughs> oh, nowhere near, but uh, I have covered enough of the grounds to know that you were right. Yes. Um, and I, it's not even something I, ever decided to do it just yes. it just happened it's so strange yes and it, it's so lovely to hear you both uh speak to so just everyone uh who has questions is waiting patiently I, we will definitely will come to those um but maybe it's worthwhile again just for context bernardo to say a couple of words on when you say there what is the, there's a sense that you will be there maybe you could say a word or two about what oh there there is a abiding experiential acquaintance with what's actually going on there is to not be swamped and overwhelmed by narrative lines by conceptual games by by thinking 
uh, like 99.9% .9 of our civilization is, especially the intellectual elite, especially the people who call themselves philosophers or neuroscientists of mind and consciousness, who do not even begin to know what consciousness is. They do not know what they are studying. They are playing a sort of conceptual game, like a puzzle game. They put the pieces together, they hit their chests in, in, in pride and they get tenure, but uh, that's how they did. They put the puzzle together and this becoming more and more obvious. As a naturalist, I look at, I look upon dissociation as just one of the things that happen in nature, like volcanoes erupt, stars go supernova, uh, black holes form, lightning strikes, dissociation happens. It's one of the potentialities of nature and given enough time and, and, and enough variability of states, it's bound to happen. Um, so I regard it much in the same way that we tend to regard life today. Um, it was bound to happen. The right circumstances were bound to eventually happen and life uh, arose. And then of course, life that has the ability to reproduce itself is the one that would stick around. In the same way, dissociation, which is another word for life, in my view, uh, dissociation, the dissociation that was capable of sort of enduring and reproducing itself is the one we see around because that's the one that lasted. Um, so for me, it's, it's a natural phenomenon and it's only pathological um, when, you, when we regard it in the context of uh, adaptability or maladaptability to a social context. Dissociation is happening non-pathological levels in all of us. Every time we dream, we dissociate. We identify with the dream avatar and not with the parts of our minds that are generating the rest of the dream. We, we dissociate every time we forget a memory that we can later remember again. Um, we dissociate every time we put things in a drawer so we can go to work in the morning. Uh, that's even a deliberate form of dissociation. You know, I compartmentalize things. I find a space for this and that. This is not pathological, this is adaptive. It's not maladaptive. Extreme forms of dissociation related to trauma are maladaptive in our social context. But the, the, the appeal to dissociation is not meant to carry over that pathological sense of dissociation to the universe, because that pathological sense only has meaning within the context of our society. Um, beyond that, dissociation is just one of the potentials of nature, like lightning and erupting volcanoes. It once happened and it endures. That, that's how I regard it. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at this. Maybe, maybe Rupert can speak to this, uh, taking in, into consideration that uh, what we meant by dissociation here is my view of life itself, how life arose. I, I would agree agree with you, Bernardo, when I say that dissociation doesn't really happen um, for a reason. It, it's, it's just, um, it's the nature of consciousness to, um, to vibrate within itself, to move within itself. And, and what we're referring to as dissociation is an inevitable um, consequence of that natural activity. But I'd like to say something about um, dissociation just add something to the to the conversation possibly ultimately uh, dissociation doesn't really happen it, it's um it, it, it's a model i think it's a an, an accurate a very useful model but uh, the best way i can i can describe this is using the analogy of going to a, a 3d imax cinema I imagine that many of you have been to a 3D cinema with your kids, if not by yourself, you go into the cinema and you're given a pair of goggles and you, you look at the screen in front of you and the screen is just a fuzzy, blurry image. You put on your goggles and suddenly you find yourself immersed in the ocean and there are fishes swimming around you. You take off your goggles not only the children, but also the adults are all reaching out their hands, trying to touch the fish 
in the ocean in which they feel that they are immersed. Now, what is it that makes us feel in, in, in the cinema that we are not um, outside the, 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 um, the image on the screen, but that we are immersed in it? Do we ever actually um, do we ever actually become immersed as a, a, an entity in the ocean? No, it, it is the activity. It, of, it, it's, it's when we put on the goggles that we seem to become immersed in the ocean. Now, in the analogy, uh, the activity of consciousness is the fuzzy, incoherent pattern on the screen. That's just the raw vibration of consciousness. It is when consciousness assumes the form of perception, that's it. it, it puts on the activity of thinking and perceiving, that with that activity, it localizes itself within its own activity. So no real localization takes place, no real dissociation takes place. It only seems to take place when consciousness puts on the glasses of a finite mind, a human mind. It puts on the glasses that consist of thinking and perceiving. It is that activity which seems to localize consciousness within itself as a separate subject of experience from whose perspective it views its own activity as the outside universe. But the dissociation doesn't actually happen. The local, I, 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 the word I sometimes use for Bernardo's word dissociation, I sometimes refer to a localization of consciousness within itself or a contraction of consciousness within itself. It's just my way of saying the same thing. But in both cases, the, 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 the localization, the contraction, the dissociation, it doesn't really happen. It only seems to be happening from the perspective of the separate subject of experience that we seem to become. Why do we seem to become this? It's because consciousness has assumed the form of perception and has therefore localized or seemed to localize itself as a point of view within itself. So, uh, although, and going back to where I started, although it doesn't happen for a reason, this localization process enables consciousness to perceive itself as the universe. Because infinite consciousness cannot perceive its own activity directly, because it would have to do so from, if, it were, if infinite consciousness were to perceive the universe directly, it would have to do so from every single point of view in the universe. It would be the deepest, darkest black image you could imagine. So in order to perceive an object, consciousness must localize itself as an apparently separate subject. So this localization, the apparent localization of ourself or the dissociation of ourself as finite minds out of infinite consciousness enables um, perception. It, it enables creation in, to take place, or, or perhaps not creation, but in a, it enables re reality, the activity of infinite consciousness, to appear as a universe. It is the means by which existence emerges out of being. It is the means by which reality, which has no form, appears as form without ever ceasing to be itself. A uh, uh, quick linguistic point so people don't mistakenly conclude that this is a second point where we differ. We don't. Uh, I completely agree with you that uh, there is no actual separation ever happening here. Yes. Uh, there is no actual even diminishing of consciousness in any exactly. way. It's an yes. illusion. Um, I use the word dissociation to refer to the illusion uh, and the word separation as what is not happening. So yes. the illusion of separation is itself a phenomenon. It's not nothing. You, it, it could perhaps not have been there, but it happens. So we have that illusion. And I refer to that illusion as dissociation. That's actually consistent yes. with the technical yes. literature in psychology because you know psychiatrists know that uh, a dissociated patient does not have multiple minds uh, and they know that because the dissociation can come to an end there can be reintegration and then the patient even knows that oh it was always me i was playing all the roles i know it now yeah. i know yeah. that i was never actually fragmented but 
he or she had the illusion of fragmentation and that's what i call the dissociation i call the illusion dissociation yes yes i i'm I, i'm well aware bernardo that you that you don't think that the that the dissociation is is real i i understand you think it's an illusion i i said that more in response to was was it batima's question about i w w why um dissociation happens so it, it was really just i wanted to to, to, to make that point, which I know we both share, that the dissociation is only in the appearance. It doesn't really happen. Yes. yes. And so certainly in the, certainly in the past, Bernardo, you've, you've, or maybe it's a hypothesis you brought forward, is that there's a sense in which um, maybe mind at large is trying to discover something about itself. And a way of achieving that is dissociation, of then being able to metacognize and look at itself. And again, just trying to draw, out, <laughs> you're, so, you're both so lovely and agreeable with each other. <laughs> we'll just to draw, draw out, a, you know, get the ratings up. The distinction. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then Rupert, in the context of, so I wonder if Dave, you want to, um, you, you might want to also unmute and read your question from the chat, but just as an introduction, if the universe already knows that about itself, there isn't, it doesn't seem to be an explicit or obvious. Um, Amir, can, I can I respond to that before? Yeah. Because it, it, we've touched on this point a couple of times now, and I'd perhaps like to explain how I, uh, the, the thinking behind my suggestion that, that um, consciousness is self-aware, and possibly make a bridge between my point of view and, and, and Bernardo's. Um, so I, I would suggest that, that consciousness is self-aware, in the same way that the sun is self-luminous. The sun, it's not possible for the sun not to illuminate itself because it's nature, because it is light. Light could not not illuminate itself because it is made of light. So the same, same thing with consciousness, then the nature of consciousness is knowing or awareness. And therefore consciousness could not not know itself because knowing is its nature however it doesn't know itself it's not meta-conscious or self-reflectively conscious in the same way that we as individuals seem to be because it its knowledge of itself does not require self-reflection it is its nature that the sun doesn't need to reflect the rays of its light off the moon in order to illuminate itself it illuminates itself because its nature is light it it, it it illuminates itself simply by being itself in other words consciousness doesn't reflect on itself in order to know itself whereas we as human beings have to reflect on ourselves in order to know ourselves so what's this connection when I say we as human beings have to reflect on ourselves in order to know ourselves, of course, it is only the consciousness in us, which is the universal consciousness that knows itself. And if universal consciousness is self-conscious, why do we as human beings seem to have to reflect on ourselves in order to know ourselves, given that it is consciousness in us that knows itself? And I would suggest that it was um, f for this reason. Um, Okay, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to introduce another analogy to, to try and make this um, simple. So the risk of mixing my metaphors, and many of you will be familiar with my John Smith and King Lear analogy. So John Smith represents infinite consciousness. So imagine that the actor, John Smith, he just naturally knows that he is John Smith. He doesn't have to reflect on himself in order to know he's John Smith. A, 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 Allow me to stretch the um, the analogy. Imagine that John Smith simply knows himself by being himself, that he requires no self-reflection. However, when John Smith plays the part of King Lear, he forgets that he is John Smith. He allows himself to become mixed up with or identified with King Lear's thoughts and feelings. And he seems then to cease being John Smith. He seems to become King Lear. Now, although the only person in King Lear is indeed John Smith, just as the only consciousness 
in each of our finite minds is universal consciousness. Nevertheless, King Lear doesn't know that. King Lear believes I am King Lear, a temporary, finite, separate person, just like our finite minds don't on the whole know that their reality is infinite consciousness. So, although the only person present in King Lear is John Smith, and John Smith knows himself just by being himself, in the form of King Lear, he overlooks that knowledge. And therefore, as King Lear, he has to self-reflect on himself in order to arrive at the experience, I am John Smith. Now, I would suggest that exactly the same thing happens, that consciousness that is the nature of each of our finite minds is by nature self-aware. But when infinite consciousness localizes itself in the form of each of our finite minds and becomes entangled with the content of experience, it overlooks the knowing of itself in favor of its knowledge of objective experience. And therefore, the finite mind has to perform this activity of reflecting back on itself in order to arrive at the recognition, I am pure consciousness. So although the, the consciousness with which the finite mind engages in that process of self-reflection is the only consciousness there is, infinite self-aware consciousness, nevertheless, in the form of the finite mind, it overlooks the knowing of its own being and therefore has to engage in self-reflection. Before John Smith ever became King Lear, was John Smith capable of having the thought, oh, I exist and I am John Smith? Are you talking about in real life or in the analogy? No, 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 in, in, your, in your metaphor. In the context of your metaphor, before John Smith became King Lear, did John Smith no. have the thought, I am no. John Smith? No, because infinite consciousness cannot have a thought before it assumes the form of a finite mind. So consciousness is knowledge of itself is prior to any formulation in thought. It never has the thought, I am conscious of myself. It would require the, it would require a finite mind, the activity of thinking, in order to have that thought. But in prior to that thought, it has the experience of being itself. And that's purely spontaneous. It's its nature. It, it's, not an ex, it's not an experience that it has. It's what it is. The awareness of being is what it is, not what it does. For the finite mind, the awareness of being seems to be an activity that it undertakes. It's something it does. It's called meditation or prayer. But for infinite consciousness, the awareness of being is what it is. Just like illuminating itself is what the sun is, not what it does. There may actually not be any difference between us. Because what you're describing now, this, this self-awareness by direct acquaintance is not what I meant, what I mean by metacognition. Metacognition would require an explicit re-representation of the contents of experience. It would require the thought, I am having these experiences, as opposed to I am the experiences. I see, uh, yes. The difference between I am hunger and uh, I, I have hunger. Okay, so Bernard, when you speak of metacognition, do you always refer to the, the, the representation of knowledge or experience? Yeah, in, in the form of a thought or, or an image. Yes. Yes. When you when you investigate the contents of your own mind, and you re-represent them, in order to assess the contents of your own mind. So, in in relation to our knowledge of ourself, metacognition would take the form of the thought, "I am." That would yes. be the primary metacognition, the primary primary formulation of metacognition, the thought, "I am." Yes, I am the subject of my experiences. Yes. But the experience to which that thought refers is prior to thinking and is the nature of consciousness. Yeah, now no, I understand you. Uh, there actually is no difference between us. Okay, okay. Well, so now there's no difference between us at all. <laughs> Great, so we can finish there and <laughs> we'll go home. Um, do, do you want to ask your question that you put in the chat? I think it's a good follow-on at this moment. 
Actually, I think my question's moot <laughs> uh, based on what, what um, Rupert and Bernardo just said. But before I ask it, uh, even though I think it's moot, um, I just want to say hi, Bernardo. I met you at the SAND conference in San Jose many years ago. And your books and thinking have really helped me a lot. And uh, I chased you around quite a bit. Uh, anyway, um, my question was, well, see, I, I think they just resolved it because my question was for Bernardo, how would the rest of your theories change if you accepted Rupert's premise that consciousness always has self-awareness? And I think what you're saying is that, um, you know, Consciousness and infinite consciousness can be self-aware, just not metacognitive in the sense that it doesn't re-represent itself to itself. So on that basis, I think the question is now rendered moot. I can still <laughs> answer by pretending to still have the misunderstanding I had about <laughs> Rupert's position. <laughs> so based on my previous misunderstanding of Rupert's position, um, if consciousness was from the get-go metacognitive in the sense of being capable of re-representing its own experiences uh, and, and separate itself from them as the subject of those experiences. In other words, to be able to say, I am the one who has hunger as opposed to I am hunger or not even that, just hunger. Um, if that is there from the get-go, that ability to explicitly introspect and self-reflect and premeditate actions, um, then the difference would be that naturalism is, it goes down the drain because nature now, the behavior of nature is the product of some form of reasoning, not anthropomorphic reasoning of the kind you and I perform, but the outcome of some form of premeditation or planning. Um, which would then immediately raise lots of questions, like, uh, you know, given all the suffering, what is it that is being, um, that, that, that consciousness is trying to achieve by putting itself through hell? And I can envision answers to that question. Uh, I can conceive good answers, uh, conceive of good answers to that question. Um, but under naturalism, the question doesn't arrive. Under naturalism, what's happening is happening because consciousness is what it is. By virtue of what it is, it does what it does spontaneously, and things happen naturally and spontaneously, and not as the outcome of some kind of premeditated planning process. Um, another way of saying that, I think, is is that nobody's in charge. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, the idea of a god of a of a god that has some kind of telos. It seems to me inc incompatible with the idea that, as you put it, I think in the lecture that um, that was recorded by Amir and sent out to us, you said that you know, um, mind at large or ultimate consciousness is, you know, in maybe instinctively or based on its nature, quote, trying to get a grip on itself, and, and so it, it's trying to get a grip on itself, and suffering and everything, all beauty and everything else is a consequence of that, and. And we're here and, and everything, you know, our, we're, we're experiencing these live, lives that we have now as a result of this, this sort of natural process that doesn't have any real telos. It's almost a, no. it's a sort of an instinctual kind of like, you I know. think you're conflating two things. Um, the argument is that there is no premeditated plan. In other words, there hasn't been a, a, a primordial conception of uh, we need to go from A to B. And I, and I know what B is, I, need, I just need to get there. A naturalism would say, there is no awareness of B. We are just going because there is some kind of natural primordial impetus towards dynamism and action for things to happen in nature. But that is not incompatible with the telos, with a goal. Um, you can have an instinctive telos. You can have um, unmediated feedback from what's happening um, in the sense that, uh, well, you, you like the way it's going or you don't like the way it's going and therefore you try to go about it in a different way, spontaneously, without planning. Um, I don't think my cat plans to go to the football and eat food, um, but he's driven to the football. He, he, he has a telos, if you know what I mean. Um, there is a direction, there is an attractor 
uh, in the future, pulling us uh, from the future. That's one way to see that. Another more accurate to see, uh, way to see that is to say it's pushing us uh, from the present. It's pushing us forward, propelling us forward, because consciousness, by virtue of being whatever it is, it has whatever dispositions it has. And those dispositions entail a preferential direction for the course of things. And if, by chance, uh, consciousness hits upon states that feel attractive, like a self-reflective state in the form of human, a human being, that uh, through which consciousness suddenly realizes that, oh, there is a chance of getting a grip, that there is a chance of getting out of what is otherwise a delirium and, 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 and putting things in perspective, because I got a taste of that. Let's do some more of that. That's not a plan. That's not premeditation. That's a, a spontaneous reaction to the current state of the world, to the, to the current state of nature. So uh, the absence of a premeditated self-reflection does not entail nihilism or the absence of meaning or the absence of telos. It only means that there isn't a primordial thought through plan about where to get and, and how to get there. That the plan is not there, uh, but the process it, it can still be steered in certain preferential directions because of the immediacy of existence in the form of experience. There can still be a de facto telos, a de facto attractor, and, and, a, and a destination. Even though it was not thought through in advance, we, was, we still get there because of the inherent dispositions of whatever nature is. I personally am convinced nature has a telos and that it has to do with explicit self-awareness. So I, I, I'm going to use the word explicit now to, to differentiate from the natural spontaneous self-awareness that uh, Rupert was alluding to. Uh, um, a, a explicit ability to think about itself, what it is doing, what it is experiencing, and sort of get a grip on itself. I think that telos is there. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that that's the way things are going. The whole of nature pushes towards higher life at great cost, at enormous risk. Look at what's happening in the world right now. We are very close to putting an end to everything. And a million years afterwards, the planet will be here again. There will be a new species and nature will be pushing it towards that emergence of explicit self-reflection. Again, the, the, the whole of nature, at least in this corner of the universe, seems to be pushing in that direction. That is a telos, even though it's not premeditated. It, it's a very sophisticated way of like scratching an edge. We think of it as sophisticated because we have complicated things so much that what is actually ultimately the simplest thing looks complicated because of our references. Um, the telos I'm talking about is pure spontaneity. It's what, it's what makes an animal uh, in the Serengeti uh, go in the direction of green pastures as opposed to going north to the dry land. I don't think the gnus have a premeditated plan to go back south uh, during the rainy season. Um, it's spontaneous, but it gives direction to their lives, to everything. And Rupert, feel free to, to chime in whenever you... Yeah. I, I agree with Bernardo. That, and let me give you a, um, a, a simple analogy, which is an, an, an analogy I sometimes use to illustrate this. I would agree that... that um, infinite consciousness has no premeditated plan um, for creation because any premeditated plan would already be something in creation. So ultimately there is no, it has no plan. However, once it has, um, once infinite consciousness has contracted into a finite mind, has dissociated, has divided itself or apparently divided itself into a subject that perceives and a, a world that is perceived. Th this um, dissociation or 
localization or contraction of itself sets up a tension within itself. It's like the analogy that I was referring to, it's like a rubber ball. If you think of a rubber ball in its natural condition, it's in a condition of balance. If you compress a rubber ball, if, you, if the rubber ball is contracted, uh, um, a tension is set up within it. And the tension is always trying to, uh, the compressed ball is always trying to revert to its natural condition. And the telos that I think we see in nature, the telos that we feel, the purpose that we all feel, every single one of us, in whatever we are striving towards, in whatever way we feel we are evolving. In the ultimate analysis, I think it is the impulse in us to revert to our natural state. It is the impulse of a finite mind to divest itself of its limitations and revert to its natural condition of infinite consciousness, which is a, a, a um, which is a balanced condition, hence I, I sometimes say its nature is, is peace. So I would agree there's no ultimate plan from the purpose of infinite consciousness, but as soon as infinite consciousness has assumed some kind of a form, that by definition that this involves a, a contraction, and that contraction is always tending to return to its original condition. And every, every, um, Every person's desire for happiness, every scientist's desire for understanding, every um, artist's desire for beauty, um, even when we look at what is taking place um, at, at, at the moment. Um, the people who are perpetrating, initiating the current situation in Ukraine, ultimately, I would suggest their motive, if it was traced back far enough, we would trace it back to the same motive that drives every single person on the earth, the motive to, to divest their mind of its limitations and return to its natural condition, albeit um, in a very perverted way. But the ultimate impulse behind all our actions is this um, desire to be divested of our limitations and return to the to reality, to the natural condition. Can I, can I ask you a quick question, uh, Rupert? Uh, probably an invitation for speculation, but you, you yeah. don't need to entertain it if you don't think it's appropriate. Yeah. Do you think that if we or when we get back to that original state to the to, to reality to the primordial state of consciousness if consciousness gets back to that state having gone through the experience of apparent limitation do you think it gets back to, the, to that state in a way that is in some sense richer than if it had just stayed in that state always or do you think it makes no difference? It just goes back to exactly where it started from. And, and the journey in that sense didn't do anything. I think it goes back to the same state for, the, for, for this reason that if there were any differences between the state of infinite consciousness before the great journey and after the great journey, those differences would have to be something objective. There would have to be something objective there to, to distinguish the two states. And if there was something objective there, it would not yet have gone all the way back to its formless self. So I, I think it's... Would an insight about itself be objective? But it, it, it's insight, it, it, if by it's insight of itself, do you mean it's knowledge of itself? I, I think it's knowledge of itself is complete at the beginning of the process. I don't think the process 
completes its knowledge of itself. Okay. I think it loses. I think. I think the loss of its knowledge of itself is the price consciousness pays for manifestation. And therefore, there is an impulse in all manifestation to regain that knowledge. Well, maybe that's a, another little difference between us to yeah. be explored. <laughs> I, I, I didn't dare call it a difference yet. But uh, if I normally I don't do that, but in your presence, I would dare to do it. Uh, I, my intuition points me in a different direction. Uh, and 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 can can you say what 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 do you feel? What is the knowledge that consciousness gains about itself as a result of the adventure of manifestation? An awareness of its intrinsic capabilities an awareness even of what it might feel like not to be itself. Um, but that doesn't give it, does that? Yes, that, that gives it, 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 it knowledge of its capabilities. It experiences its capabilities, but does that give it any additional knowledge of its essential nature? No, no. That, that, that's all I'm saying. I, I'm saying that it doesn't, it doesn't derive any new knowledge about its essential nature as a result of the adventure. Of course, it experiences an aspect of itself that it wouldn't otherwise experience in the absence of the adventure. But I don't think it gets new knowledge of its essential nature. I, I, I agree, but I, I, my intuition is that it gains some knowledge that is not about its essential nature but it's very interesting nonetheless. Uh, let, let me give you uh, my, uh, at least the closest experience that has pointed me in that direction. Um, recently, I've managed to get in touch with my spontaneous child self again. And it, it, it's been a long journey to, to succeed in doing that. It looked like it was hopeless for the longest time. Um, but, you know, getting back to building computers and designing things, getting back to that spontaneous childish, um, childish, not in a childish sense, but in, in spontaneous and innocent state of mind. Um, I, I, I've recovered a lot of that. I, I've, I've found a very subtle path to be there again. And the sense I have is, yes, I'm that child again, but it's not a circle, it's a spiral. I am that child again, but with a awareness of what it means to be that child as opposed to not being that child. A sense of contrast and context that, that wasn't there before. And, and yet there is no extra knowledge about the essential nature of the child. Um, it, but there is something that is not that knowledge of the essential nature. And I, I, I can't pin down what, what that something is, but it's an observing something. It's the child being the child, but now observing itself being the child, which wasn't there before. Before, it was just the child being the child. So th that's, that's my uh, intuition based on my, if I dare to do so, based on my personal introspection. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, all, all, all of that uh, I, um, makes good sense, I, I would agree with. I think I was just refer answering your question in relation to consciousness's essential knowledge of itself. Yeah, I agree that uh, that, cannot, uh, that cannot change. Okay, well, in that case, we still haven't found anything to disagree So uh, it, it's for me at least. It's great to hear you. I, I see lots of people smiling and lots of uh, positive comments and, and many great questions. And just to say, uh, hopefully, anyone, if you look through the chat and the other questions, it's obvious that we're not going to get through to all the questions. So apologies in advance. If I could, I I, I would um, have space for them all. So I'll just try and pick one that I think represents uh, quite a lot of other questions and in the chat and also in the Q and A from previously. Um, 
which which follows on from where we are in the conversation and sludge and, uh, and again i apologize each time for probably mispronouncing your name if you want to because a few people resonating with your question um if you're able to unmute yourself yes go for it uh i was wondering um how do i understand this of course i always hear you say and talk that peace and happiness is the very nature of mind or consciousness and it's the very nature of our own self huh? uh, which i'm afraid we see little proof of uh, in the collective experience now at this moment and you also say uh, that the pull of consciousness uh, that we feel and experience as suffering is in fact pull backwards or return to our true self, huh? to our true nature of peace and happiness. However, when I hear Vernardo, I hear him describe universal consciousness not as peaceful, but as being in a state of similar to delirium, he says. Uh, Bernardo, the way I hear him, says that the only way mind can talk to itself and make sense of itself is through this inner imagery. And that inner imagery is very chaotic, uh, he says, and, and it is delirium-like without a higher level of mental function. And of course, that higher level of mental function, it achieves through us, huh? through that metacognitive capability that we as humans have. And then we can contemplate and, and, and think and, and, and make choices in the, in the sense that see, okay, this doesn't work. This is painful. I'm not going to do that anymore. And this is good. This brings me, you know, peace or joy or, and I, I will do that. And in that way, through that kind of contemplative activity, that universal consciousness can escape uh, that uh, delirium and, and house and get a grip of itself. I think either I'm not understanding you right, or please, um, could you explain that to me? I don't think this is uh, one of the potential differences between us. If I understand Rupert, his point is that underlying and prior to the chaos of experience, consciousness innermost essential nature is peaceful. And I, I don't disagree with that. Um, on top of that peace comes the chaos of experience. Um, and, then, and then there is that instinctive drive a return to to the ground state. Um, it's a technical term. It, I'm using it metaphorically, but uh, in engineering we talk a lot of in physics as well. The ground state. It's the state before the chaos of excitations come to play. Uh, but so that's my understanding. Maybe Rupert can speak more to yes, this. Yes, no, it, it's absolutely right. I would say it's the same. That um, going back to the brief. Um, contemplation we did at the beginning of, of this meeting where I suggested um, taking off or letting go of or uh, um, divesting oneself of all the, the temporary elements of one's experience, sights, sounds, tastes, textures, smell, all, all the excitation of experience, as, as Bernardo would say, all, all, the, all the chaos, thoughts, feelings, sensation. If we, if we take off, all, all, all of these are, are temporary elements of experience they come and they go therefore they cannot be essential to us if we take off all of that like taking off our clothes at night what what remains is is just naked self-aware being and prior to the activities of thinking feeling sensing and perceiving there is no agitation there there's no movement there and from a human perspective we refer to that absence of movement as peace it's uh, ultimately we shouldn't really ascribe any qualities to it but from a human perspective it's the experience that we know as peace when, when we experience peace what we are experiencing whether we realize it or not is is the background of awareness the background of consciousness who, whose whose nature is peace and its peace is present not just in the absence of objective experience it's present during objective experience just as the 
the screen remains present during the movie, but we lose contact with it when we lose ourselves in the content of experience and therefore we have to find our way back to it. Rupert, if I, if I may ask you a question, maybe I, I suspect now that they, maybe this is what uh, uh, Sladiana was, was uh, hinting at. Do you think the aspects of consciousness that are not us, that are not in, encapsulated in a living form, uh, do you think those sort of transpersonal aspects of consciousness are in peace, are in that ground state, or those aspects are also undergoing the chaos of experience in some form of another, or another? Well, I think those aspects that are not local, if I understand you right, those aspects that are not localized as each of our finite minds, it's not that they're having the chaos of experience, they are the chaos of experience. Yeah, yeah. They are what yeah. the chaos of experience looks like from exactly. this chaotic exactly. point of view. But yeah. underlying that chaos is the same ground of peace that we find underlying our own chaos of experience. Yeah. No, again, no difference between us at all. <laughs> Most debates um, that you take part in, um, Bernardo, I don't really do debates in the way you do, but most of your debates are, are trying to find common ground with your, with your, um, with your fellow debater. And in this case, we're trying to find differences, not very successfully. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, ha honey, do you want to follow on? So I, I do, <laughs> maybe you can just yeah. be aware of the other questions that resonate with your question as you as you bring that in so i think that suffering point is a good a good point of contention yeah um hi rupert hi uh, bernardo also want to express uh my gratitude to to both of you you're my uh, dream team um but i want to stir some trouble uh here so uh, um, look, one thing, I, and I brought this up, I attended the last course uh, with Bernardo as well. I don't know if you remember, Bernardo, I brought this up that uh, you still end up being very negative uh, at, at, in, in your assessment of life. Uh, and uh, and um, we, we, we even sort of debated about, you know, the, the experience of um, that pure uh, core subjectivity, I think is what the Ite calls it core subjectivity, and I make the argument that at worst it's pretty, pretty neutral, which is what you, Rupert is saying. It's the lack of a sense of lack is itself what we're defining as happiness. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion or elation. It's just a pure peace um, that uh, is its ultimate nature. Whereas um, I think you still kind of focus a lot more on the, the suffering itself. You take it more seriously. Whereas what Rupert is highlighting just now, he was saying is that even in the midst of all the chaotic experience, there is actually that peace still there. And that for me personally, uh, that's made the biggest difference. You know, the, the, the suffering doesn't touch you. It's there, it is what it is, it's doing its thing but it doesn't touch that core subjectivity. Whereas you seem to take it much more to heart uh, in, in the sense of being very negative about it uh, and uh, treating it as though it is the ultimate nature of where we are. Uh, I don't know if I'm being uh, fair, but I, I do see a, a slight difference in attitude at least uh, where Rupert, and, and this links to what Sajano was saying that, um, and uh, Rupert speaks of, you know, the true nature being peace, joy, and happiness, and love. You don't speak of it that way. It's, it's an attitude difference, perhaps. That's fair. That there's obviously an attitude difference because Rupert is speaking from a place that I occasionally have visited for brief uh, periods of time, but uh, I, I don't abide there. I, I'm not in the place where he is. And, and and you hear it, um, and I've come to accept that this is how it is. Um, 
what you can always be sure is that I will always be sincere in what I say. Um, I, I have the same understanding Rupert has that the, the ground state of consciousness is a state of no lack, no desire. Um, it's also, in a sense, in the nature of consciousness to get out of that ground state because it's happening all the time. So um, it is in the nature of consciousness to be in other states as well, but I don't deny that the ground state is the state you described. It is the state that Rupert speaks from, and it is not the state where I live most of my life. But, but uh, just one last interjection that, but Rupert, I think what you're, you're trying to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You'd let me know if I'm wrong about this, but it, I think what you're emphasizing the most in a way is that even when you're not in that kind of ground state, as Bernardo put it there, that the peace and the, the fulfillment, the completeness never leaves or it's never missing it is actually there throughout you don't have to uh, to use your screen analogy you don't have to switch off the screen to be in that state of, of happiness the, 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 if you recognize the screen it can stay on and the horror movie can be on but you don't need to switch it off right i don't know if, uh, let, let's say at least that it's uh, uh, this um contact with the background of pieces almost always present we, we have to leave open the possibility not just the possibility the fact that there are some experiences which still have the capacity to to veil our innate peace and i i don't like to say never because we, we never know what what's around the corner i can say this from my own experience that Fewer and fewer experiences have the capacity to take me away from the piece of the background. And when they do, it lasts for less and less time. So just to give you a, a sense of my um, trajectory, uh, it, it, when I first started exploring these matters in my, in my late teens, like, like, like most people, my experience was I would say 100% involved with the content of my experience, apart from those moments that, that are given spontaneously by nature, the fulfillment of the desire, a gap between thoughts, the piece of deep sleep. But my conscious waking life, my attention was almost exclusively involved with the content of my experience. And as I said earlier, as a result of suffering, I began to explore the nature of my experience and there would be brief glimpses brief recognitions oh yes what i essentially am is the awareness that knows my experience i am not essentially anything that is experienced so there would be these brief moments of recognition that were always accompanied by peace and joy because i was relieved of the tyranny of experience but very quickly the tyranny of experience would would overwhelm me again and i would be back in 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 my suffering so i would have to trace my way back again and that was really what the my practice involved in one way or another go, going back uh, losing myself in the content of experience so there would be this back and forth but what i noticed and of course i only noticed this in retrospect was that every time we go back from the content of experience to the background of experience we are without necessarily realizing it we are weakening the power that objective experience has to take us away from the background and as a result therefore of this back and forth process we begin to spend more and more time so to speak in the background we begin to be in the traditions it's called being established in, in, in the piece of your true nature, we begin not just to visit it from time to time, we, we begin to live there. And the more we live there, the, 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 the less experience has the, the 
power to take you away until at some point you feel basically established, not, not, not in that, but, but as that. And as I say, there are still some experiences that have the power to take one away, but, but fewer and fewer and for less and less periods of time. I, I, if I can just comment on something very spontaneously here, but I, I can attest that, uh, I mean, you're seeing him on the screen now, but uh, Rupert, he exudes peace. Um, it sort of radiates uh, from, from his presence. I am nowhere there, um, but what I did notice happening to me, and it's frankly not welcome, um, is uh, an inability to stop empathy. Um, it's sort of sort of being laid open and naked to the streams of suffering that are going around this planet, especially now. Um, and, and that's for me has been one of the more marked consequences of idealism, sort of sinking into the body, to the inability to control uh, empathy, um, which is very different from a sense of pure ethics or morality because otherwise you know after i've given a whole bunch of money to ukraine if it were only a question of morality i would feel i've done my part as it is it, it helped not at all it didn't change anything at all a number changed on my bank account and so what um so that's that's one of the things that hopefully this is an intermediary station on the way and another thing, and, and now it's a, it's a personal disposition, which maybe doesn't help me much, but um, I have a innate drive or curiosity to engage with the images of mine. I find them irresistibly appealing, even knowing that they are just the noise of mind on top of the ground state, even knowing that I'm fascinated by it. And, um, and at great cost, I engage with uh, the images because I'm so irresistibly fascinated by them. Anyway, I don't know whether this helps in any way, but just wanted to put it out there. Can, can I just um, follow on? from something you said there, Bernardo, about empathy. Uh, empathy, uh, um, sympathy, compassion, they all come from the same, it's just the Greek and Latin version of the same, the same uh, um, understanding, which is the ability to, to feel somebody else's experience as one's own. And that's what empathy is. If someone is suffering, we feel their suffering as our own suffering. We feel it as intensely as we feel our own suffering. In fact, we cannot distinguish between, when I say our suffering, I mean our suffering being caused by something in our own lives, as opposed to empathizing with someone else's suffering. Uh, that you're not actually experiencing the conditions that are giving rise to their suffering. So in that sense, it's not your own personal suffering. Nevertheless, you feel the suffering as your own. Now, why is this the case? Why do we, why do we watch what is taking place on, in Ukraine? Why do our hearts break? Why do our hearts melt when we see this? It's because of this, because of empathy. We feel the other's suffering as our own. Why do we do this? It is, I would suggest it, it's because our being our essential reality is the same essential reality, the same being that, that, that the suffering person essentially is. And it is because of, 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 of this, although we may not formulate it to ourselves like this, but, but it, it, it's because it, we are literally the same, whatever we call it, the same self, the same consciousness, the same being, that we have this ability to empathize. So I think this increase in empathy is an inevitable consequence of this understanding, which doesn't mean that you go around with a big grin on your face. No, it, it's we, 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 we suffer another person's suffering as our own. But it's not the suffering in the Vedantic tradition we, we, we 
we hear that ignorance of our true nature is the cause of suffering. But I think that's too simplistic. The, the suffering that we feel as a result of empathy with another who is suffering doesn't come from ignorance of our true nature. On the contrary, it is an expression of our understanding that we share our essential nature with the other. And as a result of that, we feel both their joy as our own joy and their suffering as our own suffering. Yeah, I, 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 I see that. Uh, it, it's very palpable. Uh, it was with, with some people the other day. Uh, we were talking about what we can do to help. And then somebody said, no need to name names, you wouldn't know them anyway, but somebody said, yeah, we need to help because it could have been us. And then it dawned on me how I changed uh, over the past two decades because I realized that he didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, because it is the, us. It, it is us. It is us. <laughs> that, it is that's us. the problem. Yeah, exactly. yes. That is the problem. And it's very palpable and it's very real and it's not romantic at all. Yeah, exactly. And maybe a question that will, um, it, again, a very important question and potentially a highlight of potential difference is in the case of someone in, in great suffering, my understanding of what you've said in the past, Lish Bernardo, is that death isn't necessarily, even in great suffering here, death isn't necessarily something to look forward to because who knows what happens next. Maybe, you know, it, whereas, again, unless I've misunderstood Rupert, Death is nothing to be feared. And in that context, if there is great suffering, should it be accelerated of like, that is the ball returning back to its original state and something to look forward to and, and hurried, hurried along if I'm in great suffering in whatever this experience is. Yeah. I, I would suggest that, that death is not the end of the being or the consciousness that we essentially are. So our essential identity our shared identity, infinite being, remains. However, nor do I think that death is necessarily the end of the finite mind. I think it's an unraveling of the finite mind, but there's nothing to suggest that the finite mind, that the, the rubber ball expands and goes all the way back. That there, there could be a, um, an an intermediary realm, for want of a better phrase, whether the finite mind has lost its lost sufficient integrity for it to appear as a body, but has not completely dissolved into infinite consciousness. So I don't think I think it's simplistic just to think that the finite mind comes to an end at death and we all go back to infinite consciousness and peace. And, and even I, in my conceptual way of looking at these things, um, the end of dissociation, death, doesn't necessarily guarantee, at least conceptually or theoretically, a return to the ground state. You can be non-dissociated, but not be in the ground state. And that's what uh, I think Amir was alluding to, one of the things I said in the past. Um, there are a great many things I haven't seen, Rupert, so maybe that's inspired by my ignorance. But as far as I can theorize about these things, I don't see the end of dissociation as the same thing as a return to ground state. You know, dissociation can end and you're still not in the ground state. Yes, 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 I think that's a similar... So that's, uh, that's the part about my anxiety about uh, the experiential state post death <laughs> even from look even from psychedelic experiences it's so clear that although you go through ego dissolution you're no longer bound by time and space i'm talking about you know, real real trips not not just tasting the waters going deep in even after the ego is gone and you're no longer in this claustropho claustrophobic locus in space and time, um, you still carry your demons with you. Um, and, and, and they manifest, they, they unfold like flowers in spring. 
um, and that's a less dissociated state. Um, it's not a nihilistic state. Um, it's not an egoic state, um, but it can still be a hundred thousand years of darkness, <laughs> um, which is of course not in time, but th 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 that's, that's the thing that is always playing in the back of my mind. We carry our demons with us. So if, if the game is to exercise the demons, I'd rather exercise them in life and not see death as a shortcut uh, uh, out of that process of integration, because I suspect it may even amplify some aspects of what we are trying to integrate in a way that we don't no longer have a handle on, because we are in a sort of fragilized state with less control. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I just want to disclose uh, quickly that uh, I'm coming at this from a physics perspective. I do have my own um, like uh, indoctrinations, you could say, but I'm very open to idealism. Uh, one of the things that I was running through for philosophical reasons was um, it's a question about anesthesia. And I know that Bernardo and uh, Rupert have touched upon these in the past, but um, it seems there's a conceivability gap here. So Rupert did touch upon the question where it seems that uh, I could be wrong, but consciousness is aware of itself experiencing. So that could be a clarification. But uh, the argument usually follows as um, under anesthesia, we're not aware. Um, the memory uh, rebuttal is valid. Uh, so your, your memories don't form. Uh, another way around is to say consciousness has no object to be aware of itself, which I got from Rupert actually. That's fine. But why I bring up the anesthesia, um, although it's a disassociative, uh, it's because it could be analogous to death. Um, Bernardo mentioned something like uh, awakening from a dream. Rupert seems to have some kind of inclination towards a meditative state or what he just mentioned prior, but um, it seems that this would recall some kind of recollection of an object or something within consciousness to know itself. But it seems just at that point, there's a gap. Um, anesthesia entails a problem to this because it would seem that knowing one is aware isn't really there and it seems that there's um hold on like uh, it would seem like it's the same thing as like death at a materialistic stance you wouldn't know you're experiencing but in materialism there's just no there's just no experience so it's it seems like there's a gap unless it's aware of itself but that would still mean a recollection so i don't know maybe i could clarify <laughs> sorry uh, kyle can, can i ask you a question have, have you experienced a general anesthetic yes okay during the experience did did you have the experience of the absence of awareness yes what had that experience um uh, like the consciousness did have or i had the experience of no experience well if if consciousness had the experience if consciousness was present to have the experience of the absence of consciousness mm -hmm. consciousness cannot have been absent because it was there having the experience you claim of its mm -hmm. own absence so i i would i would encourage you to look more closely at what happened under anesthetic when i ask you did you have the experience of the absence of awareness you said yes. That is not possible because <laughs> that which experiences is by definition aware. So you didn't have the experience of the absence of awareness. Your mind, when when the your thinking and perceiving faculties returned after the anesthesia wore off, you presumed that you had the experience of the absence of consciousness because you couldn't remember anything and you looked at your watch you conflated the two experiences and you presumed that awareness was absent and then you substantiated that by belief by believing that you were aware of the absence of consciousness right but it it, it seems at that point if you're not a, if you're not aware of anything but consciousness itself it seems to be the same thing as a materialistic paradigm because you're not aware of anything. And I know, I know you answered that, but I don't know 
there's something something missing well no a materialistic paradigm would suggest that would suggest <laughs> the absence of consciousness which is completely the opposite of the the point of view that bernardo and i are speaking from which is that consciousness is is eternally present there's no such thing as the the the, the beginning or the ending of consciousness it is it is the one ever present reality mm -hmm. so then if i carry that on to after death um would it just be analogous to that because it seems you know when you're in a meditative state of some sort you're kind of aware of awareness or in Kastrup's model, it shows that maybe you're awakening from the dream. You're like, oh, this is what it's about. And I just don't see you. I, I, would, I would suggest that death is more like, as we were saying, I think both Bernardo and I suggested in the previous conversation that, that death is, is uh, the de delocalization of the mind, but not the complete, not necessarily the complete extinction of the mind. In other words, death would, in this analogy, would be closer to what takes place in a dream than what takes place in anesthesia. In a dream, your experience of, of, of the world disappears, but images remain. You don't, you don't go just to the, to the, it's not an island. Yeah. So death would be, um, could be, uh, in fact, when we dream at night, in fact, when we fall asleep at night, falling asleep at night could be a, a little rehearsal for death in that we lose the awareness of the of the um, of this world because we are no longer viewing it from the point of view of this body. But we are still aware of the deeper regions of each of our finite mind in the form of images, the dreamed world. There's nothing to suggest that that may not continue after death. Right. So it's not annihilation. It's still aware of something. But but in either case whatever the content of each of our finite minds after death the awareness which is the essential nature of each of our minds remains continually present throughout the waking dreaming deep sleep and death states whatever those death states are just like the screen remains present during your youtube clips your photos your your documents your your your, your emails and when even when all of those have, have closed down, it's still the, the still present behind your screensaver. It, it's in every possible configuration. The screen is still present, untouched, unchanged. Okay, thank you very much. I I wonder what uh, I did uh, mention Bernardo, so I'm concerned if I misrepresented him or <laughs> his ideas. So. But thank you very much. No, no, I, I can I can try to add something without being redundant. Obviously, you did your homework. You already alluded to the argument of memory that all we can know is that we don't remember being aware, not that we were not aware. Um, so you probably did your reading there. So I, I try to add something. When you talk about anesthesia, we have to be aware that there are many very, very different kinds of anesthesia. Um, if you take ketamine, that's one mechanism of, of, oper of operation. Um, general anesthetics used today, uh, they are not like psychedelics. They don't put your brain to sleep. They don't reduce brain activity. They inject noise in the brain. They are dissociatives. So in, there's so much noise in your brain that you cannot form memory pathways or have a coherent perceptual experience. So you don't feel pain. You, you are in another state that you can no longer remember afterwards. So it depends on what anesthesia you, you, you are taking. Now, um, five years ago, uh, almost five years ago, I had to undergo what was supposed to be a very painful um, medical examination. So I was given a, a light dose of a general anesthetic, not to knock me down completely, but just make it pass fast. Um, and uh, they injected the anesthetic, and then a few seconds passed, and I was waiting for something to happen or to stop happening but nothing happened and, and and the medical staff was not doing anything and then i asked them so when when will you, when will you begin and then they said well we already finished um it's already done so that anesthetic operated in a way that has to remind us that we do not know what time is um physics is all over the place about time some say time is the only thing that is fundamental 
Others say it doesn't even exist. Yet others, which is the latest fact, uh, fashion in loop quantum gravity, say that time exists, but it's epiphenomenal. It's not a fundamental scaffolding of nature. So what the anesthetic seems to be doing is uh, whatever time is, if, if everybody's on this timeline traversing from one side to the other, when you get an anesthetic, it seems to do this. Everybody else is going through the loop, but you, you cut across. So it, you have to remember that we do not know what time is. And to say that you were not conscious at a moment in time uh, presupposes knowledge that we do not have about what it means to say that you were conscious and is not conscious at a moment in time. Because we do not know exactly what time is. All indications are that time is a, a dimension of our cognitive capacity. It's, it's a category of cognition. And Kant was the first one to put that forward 250 years ago. Schopenhauer resonated with him on that. And the latest on the neuroscience of perception, cognitive neuroscience science, indicates that time indeed is a very, very subjective thing. And even as far as um, objects are concerned, it is also relative. We have known that now for a hundred years. So uh, hold your horses uh, when you feel tempted to extract too many conclusions from the phenomenology of, a, of a, uh, an anesthetic, because what it may be doing may have absolutely nothing to do with lack of consciousness. It may have everything to do with what it does to time. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for the clarifications. But then, sorry, one last thing. It seems that if you boil it all down, it's one core subjectivity that remains. And I think Kastrup has mentioned that before. You are, it's all of us. It's that thing. So, and that's what I mean when material wasn't blown, you, you don't die. So, yeah. <laughs> Death <laughs> happens in you, yeah. not to you. Yes. But not for your tights, yeah. <laughs> take the, take, if, you, if you go on to click on your gallery view, the top right hand corner of your screen, and depending on the size of your screen, you'll see 25 or 49 images. So 49 in my case, 49 different faces, different people. But and there seem to be clear distinctions between them. But if we touch their reality that there are no distinct, we don't find any divisions or distinctions in the screen. And if someone were now to turn off their ca camera, this would be the equivalent of dying in our analysis. You turn off your camera and the, your image disappears, but your reality, the screen, remains exactly as it always is. It, it doesn't experience, there's no disappearance at the level of the screen, the level of reality. There's only a disappearance in the level of the way that reality appears as an individual. Let's keep in mind that historically, this has been the most obvious understanding the history of humanity, uh, to the point that uh, to even raise the question would sound silly. Um, it's a very recent phenomenon that suddenly this has become not only questionable, but implausible. Yeah. It's a very peculiar situation <laughs> we are going through. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I'm very grateful to you both, Rupert and, and Bernardo. You've changed my life in many ways. But my question has to do with the metaphors, mind at large, John Smith to King Lear, the dreamer to Jane in Paris. It, I, initially, I thought they were metaphors, but, but then I saw Bernardo on a video talking about the Big Bang and how it was the universe or the manifestation speaking to us or asking us a question. So my question is this, from, for you, from your perspective, Rupert, is it the infinite plane of potential and then a contraction? within which there are many other contractions. So is it a mind that functions as a mind similar to our mind? And, and in, in your case, Rupert, really the question is, can mind at large, if there is such a thing, can it be veiled from its true self? 
can it be in crisis? No, no, no. Uh, ultimately, no. It's like asking, can, uh, uh, um, and this is where I started to, to today with the, with the meditation. It's like asking, can a screen be veiled by a movie? Let, let's imagine if, if the movie was dark enough, could or violent enough, could, could it veil the screen? No, because all there is to the movie is the screen. There's nothing in the screen other than the screen with which the screen could be veiled. It's veiled by our belief that the landscape in the movie is real in its own right. Likewise, reality doesn't lie behind appearances, because if we believe that reality is veiled by appearances, then appearances must be something other than reality that has the power, that have the power to veil that reality. How could there be something that had veiling power that was not itself real? So, no, ultimately, uh, the, 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 the veiling of reality is an illusion. Yes, but it's real. It has to function as an illusion. My but, question the, is more, is, is, is it the infinite field then a contraction within which there are other contractions? You understand what I mean? Is it a mind as mind at large, which is kind of the initial contraction as opposed to the, the infinite field? Because if, if from Bernardo's perspective, it is, it can be in crisis, it can ask itself or ask us to explain to it why it comes from nothing where these creation myths come from. It, it doesn't seem to be, it, it doesn't seem to be the, the initial field, but something that comes afterwards. It, not sure I've understood your, your question, but it, as regards contractions within contractions, yes, each of our finite minds is a contraction or a localization or dissociation of infinite consciousness. But then each of our minds, uh, it, uh, uh, our mind is able to fall asleep at night and again to localize itself within itself in the form of the dream character. So that is a, a, a localization within a localization. Yeah, but do you think that do you think like Bernardo does that is trying to make sense of itself that the manifestation is asking itself questions through symbolism? I think that the world is a, um, um, a representation, a, a, a symbol of the deeper layers of our finite minds. That that, that, that or that the, the deeper layer of, of um, that aspect of our finite minds that is shared, so the the, uh, the transpersonal mind. I think the world is is how that mind appears to us, and it gives us um, yes, it, it, it's it gives us knowledge in in the same way. When we let's say you you have a fearful disposition in the waking state, let's say you are a, a fearful person. Fear tends to be your your kind of most elementary uh, emotion. When you fall asleep at night, you may dream that you're being chased by a tiger. In other words, what is your environment? But what is your what is the emotion on the inside of you in the waking state? What is the content of your mind in the waking state appears as your environment in the dream state? So the, the fact of dreaming um, externalizes in the form of the world what in the waking state lies inside you as a feeling. So could it be that what we experience as the world is an exteriorization of the activity of consciousness, which, which is the... the shared region of each of our minds. Just lost that last 10 seconds, if you could repeat. That, 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 um, that the world is an, in the same way that the, the tiger tracing us in our dream is an exteriorization in the dream world of our inner experience in the waking state. Could it be that what we experience as the world in the waking state is an exteriorization of the um, deeper regions of the of, of 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 each of our finite minds, that 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 the shared region of each of our finite minds, that aspect of our finite minds that are shared, 
as opposed to our own personal thoughts, for instance, which are not shared. The deeper regions of each of our mind, the transpersonal regions, are, are shared. They, they, they expand beyond the limitations of each of our finite minds and consider the possibility that that is what is appearing to us in the form of the world. So there is this profound connection between the, the, the deeper layers of the mind and the way the world appears to us. I'm not sure whether I'm answering your, responding to your question. Uh, um, sorry, I, I don't, don't. Kiran. Really, Kiran. But uh, I'm trying to say something about um, the, 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 the imagery that appears to us in the world, its connection with our deep psychology. I think there is a very profound connection. But from Bernardo's point of view, it's trying to make sense of itself. You, let me, I was tempted to, to try to, to jump in to, to clarify this point. Mm. It is trying to make sense of itself insofar as the it encompasses us and asks the questions it asks through us. Because to ask a question, what am I? you need that explicit metacognition that uh, that exists in the universe as far as we know through us so universal consciousness is trying to make sense of itself in the sense that we are part of it and we are doing the question asking now if you define linguistically mind at large as the segment of universal consciousness that is left behind after you account for all living beings then that mind at, at large, which Rupert referred to as the exteriorization of, of, of the deeper layers of our minds, that mind at large is not asking any question because it, it is not the explicitly metacognitive part of universal consciousness. Okay. It is providing a mirror to ourselves. Hmm. So yes, the questions are being asked by the universe insofar as we are part of the universe and even to say i do that often because I, I have to speak the language of logic and unambiguous concepts and all that but even to talk about parts there's a profound injustice to what's going on because there is only one thing going on and <laughs> and, and that's what people really don't understand and listening to me will not help them understand because of the way i try to keep the concepts clear and separate and unambiguous it really is you. <laughs> there is only one mind going on. And, yeah. and it's not something that is not you. And the day you really see this for the first time, you'll be floored. You'll go like, shit, it really is me. <laughs> mm. No, it's not Kieran. <laughs> but it really is you. Mm. Um, so the, the talk of parts and and alters and mind at large versus universal consciousness, that's a precarious attempt to sort of corral that into an unambiguous linguistic framework that your intellect can check and then put a little check mark on it and say, this passes the rigor of logic and reason and, and, and empirical evidence. But it, it is not going to give you a fair picture of what is one is really trying to convey of, of, of what the acquaintance with the reality of what's going on really tells you. And, and that's why a lot of people, when they listen to what I'm saying, and sometimes I say, well, if the body is the image of a dissociative process, um, and when you die, the body disappears, that's the end of the dissociation. And a, lot, a lot of people think that, well, that means it's the end of me. Because I understand that there is this feud of subjectivity, this mind at large business and all that stuff, but that's not really me. And they may even intellectually convince themselves it's them, but they don't feel like that. Mm. And you will only feel like that if you internalize the feud and you understand that this feud of subjectivity in a sense is surrounding you, but in reality, it is in you. Mm. Mm. And, and if you can play this, this ping pong game of looking at the facts of the matter from these two perspectives, until the cognitive dissonance, the apparent contradiction between the two dissolves, then, then, then you will see. 
then you will understand and then you will sympathize with me and the precariousness with what I'm trying to say, because you will, you will realize that darn, and there is no way to actually say this. What, what is the place, if any, for worship? So this idea of the, of, you know, the divine or angels or entities that are higher in some sense, or even uh, the worship of nature in, in either or both of your perspectives. Worship, um, praise, uh, it w w is the inevitable outcome of the, the recognition of the one reality whose nature is peace and for whom there is no separation or otherness, in other words, whose nature is love. But love is the, the, the human term we give to the absence of otherness, the absence of separation, which is the nature of the one reality. So worship, praise, awe, humility, gratitude, uh, th these are just the, the, the inevitable outcome of this recognition of the the indivisible, the infinite and indivisible nature of reality. I can comment uh, briefly. While in a, in this localized or dissociated state, um, in which mind is not uh, immediately uh, acquainted with its true scope it will have the tendency to acquaint itself with itself by proxy. Um, we know that from psychology, for instance, very down to earth, um, the parts of your own personality, of your own dispositions, of your own thoughts, your own value judgments, your own tendencies that you do not want to recognize because you are ashamed of them or you have bad associations with them, whatever and you repress them, and you push them deep down so you do not have to become directly acquainted with that as those aspects of yourself, you will become acquainted with them by proxy. You will project them on other people, and you will go for a dance with yourself through the proxy of somebody else who is serving as mirror. And you will do that even without knowing. Uh, the Germans did that with the Jews, um, a particularly pernicious type of dance but their own avarice their own materialism that they would not recognize themselves to to have in in, in the 1930s um was projected onto somebody else and they went for a very pernicious dance together mind went for a dance with itself this is what mind does if it cannot have a a relationship with all of its aspects by direct acquaintance. And insofar as we are dissociated and we do not recognize in an abiding way uh, what we truly are, the, the truly grand aspects of what we truly are will need to interact with us by proxy. And the proxy will be... Uh, uh, a religious icon, um, a symbol, it will be liturgy, um, and it will be exteriorized apparently. Um, but at heart, the reason that that will appeal to you, that that will sort of latch onto you in a way that you can't even explain to yourself why that is gripping you so much. The reason is that you it's a private dance of yourself with yourself um, in which mind speaks to itself and reveals itself to itself by proxy, by imagery. And from that perspective, I would say it's the next best thing to enlightenment. Maybe I'll just say something. Um... Bernardo, I've, I, I know I've said this to you in, in private before, but I think in view of our previous 
kind of conversation, the beginning of our conversation, when we talked about the two different um, our two different approaches, and and you mentioned my saying to you um, two or three years ago that that I felt that the the fruits of your understanding would 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 come later, and and I I've I, I, I do feel that, but I also feel that there's some there's some great intelligence, although I know that 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 you've struggled with it, that you've you've suffered a lot as a result of it. But I think there's in, intelligence. Are we? Am I still here? Yes. I, I think there's an intelligence in this, in that um, the work you're doing, um, which I have, as you as you know, I have the, such great respect for it and i think it's um you're you're, you're speaking to a, a a group of people to a lot of people that that are outside the field that i'm speaking to and um in a way that i'm not able to because you're you're of your background in in um, science and and i feel the way i said it to you once was that i felt that the I, I expressed it in religious terms that God had postponed the fruits of your understanding to um, in order to keep you motivated to do the work you're doing. I can no longer see you, um, Bernardo. I've, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm, oh, you're here. Yeah, that that, um, <clears throat> that I felt. So I, I expressed it to you. I think in this in in you religious did. language. But I I I feel that there is a a, a deep intelligence to um the process you're going through and, and the fact that the you may feel the fruits of your understanding have yet to come fully into into your experience i think in a way it's a it's um it's a kind of sacrifice you make not consciously of course but it's it's a sacrifice that that you make or is made through you that that enables you to do the incredible work that you do in, in the world for, for, for which I, I have the greatest admiration. So it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful sacrifice. I, I think I mentioned it to you some recently uh, that uh, if, if that is so, I'm, I'm completely in peace with it. I, I, I don't struggle with it anymore. Um, I, I have met a peace in the sense that I'm not in peace. Yes. But I am in peace with the fact that I'm not in peace, if you know what I mean. So I don't yeah. have that meta struggle. It's the it's price you okay. pay for your work. It's the <laughs> price you pay for your beautiful work. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I, I, I don't know. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> that's, that's the point where I came to. It is what it is. Well, uh, um, I'm going to, to, to leave you beautiful conversation um, as always with um, Bernardo and Amir it's very nice to meet you very nice to, to meet your group beautiful searching questions thank you and thank I you for inviting think, me to join you yeah thank you so so much for coming I've I've followed um, Bernardo's work in a very obvious way for quite some time uh, run these courses but I've attended many of your talks and and listened to many of your uh, talks on YouTube as well as in person and and just to encourage these uh, conversations, I feel like I've understood aspects of what you, well, what each of you presented by witnessing you in dialogue. So um, it it did what I hoped it would do, which was deepen my appreciation, understanding, and and access to an experience. I think, and I'm I'm sure that will be echoed by many people. Um, so just encouraging more of this, if if there's appetite for it, I'd be very happy to host it. It's been an honor, um, but I'm sure there's many other avenues for this to happen again. So thank you, Rupert. Thank, thank you, you, Rupert. Amir. Thank you, Bernardo. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. How vigilant do we need to be of the convenient fiction? You know, when we're talking and we're using our words in these conversations, you know, Rupert often says uh, consciousness, you know, refracts itself and then he quickly changes it to apparently refracts itself. So I'm wondering, is it just the obsessive compulsive in me and the scientist in me that always wants to make sure we're reaffirming? you know, that we're never talking about, you know, the dissociated authors. This is a beautiful, convenient fiction to help us understand the ineffable in a way. So do you have any 
I know you try to be very precise, so it's not. I'm not really pointing it at you. I'm saying overall in the conversation, do you ever notice we kind of conflate that the two different territories you've talked about and get like frustrated that we've just gone from like talking as consciousness and then talking as what it looks like to be consciousness? You know, can you talk a little bit about some of that, maybe? It's or? almost impossible to avoid that um, once yeah. the monster of language is out of the box. It's very, very hard to put it back in and keep perspective uh, of the difference between a symbol that points at something and the something that is pointed to by the symbol. We, we conflate the two all the time. So language, if we want to be really rigorous, language is a coherent set of hints. That's what it is. It, it's a set of hints. Things that hint at other things. Uh, the things that are hinted at are not what is said. What is said is the hint. Um, so you are correct. And the, the idea of convenient fictions, it, it's even more exacerbated when it comes to scientific models. But at least there we know, or at least the people who think about it, they know that these are convenient fictions. They are aware of the distinction not the spokespeople of science. Uh, those guys are not real scientists. They are the spokespeople of science. But th the thoughtful ones are aware of the distinction. But when it comes to everyday colloquial language, uh, the distinction is lost and, and it is almost impossible to recover. Not in this day and age, not in our culture, not in, our, in the value systems we use today. The, the, the subtlety of the difference is, is, is lost. And um, it, it's what's saving us is that every now and then somebody like he, like you realizes that there is a difference, and 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 goes like, oh my god! But we should be talking more about the difference. <laughs> so every now and then somebody like you shows up and notices it. So the idea is kept alive in mind, in the bigger mind, because every now and then there is a spark of it again. Uh, when an observer like you notices it and reintroduces that thought, reintroduces that realization, that spark into the broader cognitive context that we share. But uh, what this amounts to is we are just keeping the seeds viable, but there is nothing germinating yet. That's a, this is a very, very long-term um, uh, enterprise to, to, to overcome the illusion generated by language not, not language, only the language that, that is spoken, because language is now has now penetrated the way we think. We think symbolically. We think in terms of pointers. And we forget that that's what thought is, a collection of hints and pointers. Uh, the, 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 the enterprise to bring this realization to the forefront in the culture is very, very long term. Idealism will be very old news by the time this enterprise becomes visible. <laughs> Thank you, Bernardo. I appreciate it. I'll do a follow-up question myself, um, which is, again, just reflecting back on this last conversation and, and hearing how the points where you thought you perhaps differed, uh, you didn't <laughs> differ as much as you thought you did. And I'm just wondering, in the context of things you've said in the past, how you... Um, you know, you went through a journey with, you know, what is non-duality, what is non-duality in the East versus how it's sometimes understood in the West, and this idea that maybe we're meant to obliterate the ego, move past the ego, and and how the West contribution is perhaps this sense of meaning of how we're looking for meaning, whereas maybe in the East, and I'm paraphrasing, and just correct my uh, paraphrase if it's completely off, um, there's a big emphasis on reducing suffering, and some way a lot of, a lot of these uh, traditions come at some level to, to reduce just it, the suffering of existence. Um, whereas maybe the Western approach is to give suffering meaning, which perhaps converge at some level, but yeah, just any thoughts which might still just be evolving based on, on this conversation today? No, no, but I mean, uh, but Rupert and I, I think we took, took one major step forward in mutual understanding today. Um, but most of what we talked about today, we had talked about before. Um, it, we need some people like Rupert who are sitting on top of the hill and showing the way because they see the way. 
and and they give us perspective they are telling us there is more to the game than than what you think is your world there there, there is another land and and in, and in it is a peaceful land um and we need those reminders we need that kind of encouragement uh but i i still think and that's based on empirical observation that the western mind is less the mind that would try to find peace and equanimity by sort of taking an observer role and more the mind that will will engage directly with the images illusory illusory as they may be the mind that will engage directly with the images that will engage with the suffering and and extract meaning from that extract the meaning that it intrinsically has they have that the images intrinsically have in other words we are not going to artificially make meaning and fool ourselves in the process we are going to extract the juice from that lemon and make lemonade uh, out of it i think that's what has historically characterized the western mind the western approach to philosophy and to spirituality and then and, and I, I don't think it's senseless um it, it, it took me quite a while to to accept that in myself um and, and to accept that i am a fundamentally a western mind uh, there was a time in my life when i would have rebelled against this notion with all my might um because i liked to think higher of me <laughs> um now i'm completely in peace with that what rupert said in the very end is almost a nod to that the notion of sacrifice to make sacred, uh, to suffer in order to make sacred. That's what the word sacrifice means, um, to sacralize. Um, uh, th that, that is the Western ethos, the Western mental ethos. And in a sense, Rupert gave a little nod to that at the very end. Mm. Yeah. Um, Aria, do you want to do that following question to Brett? And by the, by the way, just to reiterate, if anyone doesn't want to unmute and they're shy, because it is recorded and then sent out to other participants, just pause for 10 seconds and I'll read your question. So don't ever feel obligated, but it's quite nice to hear other voices. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you again for taking the time, Bernardo, Amir, and also Rupert, who's not with us anymore right now. Um, I'm not sure how to formulate this question, honestly, but I feel... Um, the, the sense is there. So to add to Brett and what you alluded to, to the monster of language, where do you think this misuse of language started at least in the West, to the Western mind? Is it a historical process? Is it a, is it a recent phenomenon 200, 300 years or it goes all the way back? Uh, it, I think it's one of the greatest mysteries um, in paleoanthropology is, is, is the origin of our ability to think symbolically, um, to use um, things that represent other things in our thought processes. Um, other animals, as far as we know, don't do that. Um, and the mystery is the following. We have been anatomically identical to what we are today for about 200,000 years, give or take 50,000 years. Um, very recent, um, but our ability to think symbolically um, began to manifest itself only about 30,000 years ago, plus minus 20,000. So at best, only in the final, in, in the last one third of our history as a species, with the brains that we have today, with the physiology that we have today, with the, the genetic uh, uh, treasure that we have today um, and in the previous two-thirds of the time people identical to us did not uh, think symbolically and that's a mystery because evolutionarily speaking um, we know that whatever genetic inheritance had to be fixed in our genome to allow for this ability to think symbolically it had been fixed 200,000 years ago and it was fixed, even though it has no use. 
which is confounding because it's an extraordinary capacity. Uh, but in the beginning, before culture, it is precisely useless. Um, when we are hunter gatherers and we have to you know, escape the tigers and hunt the mammoth and find the tree which has the good fruit, um, we don't need to write the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, no, we, 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 we don't need the epics, we don't need literature, we don't need discourse, uh, we, don't, we don't need language. So long as you can point to where the tree with the good fruit are and scream when a tiger appears, like meerkats do, uh, it's fine. So it's an extraordinarily, it's an extraordinary ability that arose and was fixed for no good evolutionary reason, um, and which remained dormant for at least a hundred thousand years, if not a hundred fifty thousand years. Um, before it manifested itself. And when it did, it changed the planet. It changed everything. It created culture, it created civilization. It allowed us to cooperate with strangers at a scale that is far beyond even what uh, colonial insects can do. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's the fall, it's the mystery of the fall. Uh, um, and, and it is, one of the three greatest mysteries facing us today. It, it's the greatest mystery of the past. Um, maybe the greatest mystery of the future is our understanding of time and UAPs. Uh, but uh, this one, this one is in the top three. Absolutely, that's what religious myths do. No? They, 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 they point, they hint. Um, not through concepts, but through feeling. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the feeling they evoke that is the hint. What is that feeling that is being evoked with the myth of the fall in the Christian tradition? What does it mean to be expelled from the Garden of Paradise, from the Garden of Eden, after you have taken a bite from a fruit of the tree of knowledge, knowledge. Yeah. the tree of knowledge of all things? And then you realize that you were naked, even though you were already naked before and you were experiencing your nakedness after you took a bite from the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Now you knew that you are naked. Oh, that's metacognition arising. That's linguistic thinking, the ability to re-represent the contents of experience through symbols uh, that, point, that point to something beyond themselves. That's the fall, and, and, and that's the origin of all suffering. That's when we had to, you know, to, to till the soil at the, with the sweat of our own brows in order to earn uh, our living. So what, what is that? Why is metacognition so tightly connected to suffering in, in, in the myth of, of, of the fall? Um, it has to do with language, because language um, gives you the power of God. It, it, it will be like God if you take a bite from the fruit of the tree of knowledge, because language allows you to create realities, to create entire universes, uh, to create the past, to create the future, uh, to give meaning. Um, it, it's, a, it's a divine power. Language is a divine power. It's the power to create reality. And we are using that power all the time, creating our own realities with our thoughts, with our inner chatter. And, and there is the origin of our suffering, but that's also the great sacrifice, the great sacrifice to the divinity. Because who put the tree in the Garden of Eden? Who put the serpent in the Garden of Eden? And who made Adam and Eve susceptible to the temptation of taking a bite from, from the fruit of the tree of knowledge? Who did it all? It was God. And, and the devil, the angel who fell first, the devil fell before Adam and Eve. In other words, the devil was more was already metacognitive before Adam and Eve. Obviously, he was serving his father, right? Even though that you know, opened up the lid of the can of suffering of Pandora's box with all the ghosts and demons, it is the great sacrifice. And it's the great sacrifice that we are called to make to God, to, to, to the divinity. And the moment of that sacrifice 
the origin of symbolic or linguistic thinking 30,000 years ago, for which a very respected scholar called Ian Tattersall said, the only reason we have to believe that something like this could ever even remotely have been possible, the only reason we have to entertain this absurdity is that obviously it happened. <laughs> Otherwise, we would never even conceive of this happening because it, it's, it, it's so unlikely, so implausible, so absurd that it happened at all is the only reason we have to think that it did happen. So that's the moment of the sacrifice and it, and it, it is the greatest mystery of the past for sure. Maybe not the greatest mystery of them all. I think the future is still holding the cards there, but it's the greatest mystery of the past. How? Why? How did this happen? You know, if you, if you can really contemplate the problem in its full magnitude, you want to scream at yourself, how, did, how could this happen? How on earth could this happen? Everything else on this earth is still completely interlinked in the harmonious web of instinct. Except... Functioning except us. Everything else is functioning in the harmony of instinct as one gigantic planetary organism in complete balance, in complete harmony, in complete order. We left that. We were expelled from the Garden of Eden by the workings of God, ultimately. Who else? Who put the tree in there? <laughs> Who made us susceptible? Yeah. I think this is one of the questions in which the best we can do is to just contemplate the mystery in awe. That's the only respectful, respectful thing to do because we are so far from getting anywhere close to the possibility of trying to answer the question that the only respectful, the only appropriate mm -hmm. attitude is to contemplate the mystery. That, and that's a lot because we live in a banalized word, world, a world that has been rendered banal by our culture. But this banality is, a, is, a, is, a, is one of the greatest illusions. There is nothing banal about our condition. We are immersed you know, in the depths of a mystery that we can't even begin to contemplate. Uh, but we think, oh, we, we think this life is so banal. You know, it's all the same thing. Nothing ever happens. All for nothing in the end. Oh man, the irony is fantastic. So even to contemplate the question goes a long way already given our reference point, the, the, the seeming banality of life. Just making an inventory of the great mysteries, right, of existence. And time is also figuring right there as one of the top mysteries of existence. I have a friend, Professor uh, Bernard Carr. Um, he's famous indirectly because an actor portrayed him in that movie, uh, The Theory of Everything. He was Stephen Hawking's first student, first PhD student. He lived with Stephen in the beginning of Stephen's uh, illness. Um, Bernard thinks that uh, the greatest mysteries will only be unraveled after we reveal and improve our understanding of time, what time is. And it's a fantastic thing because obviously it's not there at all. It doesn't even exist. Um, but something is happening that forces us to create this notion of time. We seem to experience it flowing. We don't, but it, we seem to. Um, and how this happens, how a reality that is essentially non-extended in other words, it has no size. It's not anywhere. It's not even happening. Um, can appear to be this enormous historical timeline that began in a past that is forever hidden behind the mists of time and, and which will unfold uh, in the future that is also hidden behind the mists of time. Something so massively extended that doesn't matter how big we imagine it to be it's infinitely bigger than that how does that happen how does this magic of 
infinity coming out of what is essentially nothing. How does this happen? Um, that's the mystery of time. And um, we, um, we are children when it comes to our understanding of time, even though we've made a lot of progress in, in the past 200 years, um, we, we hardly begun. Um, I, I think this is also one of those things that at some point in history, we, we will realize that, oh my God, we finally have a more or less proper understanding of time now and that will make history, all the history before that point, look like infantile stuff, like children playing in a sandbag, sandbag, Zonbach in Dutch. Um, 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 and we'll probably even feel sorry, people in the future will, will, will feel sorry about us in our ignorance. And, and they will realize that uh, we today, we haven't got a chance. We don't even have a chance to wrap our heads around what's really happening. Um, what we can do is theorize um, in a way that eliminates some glaring mistakes. And that's already progress. We can take a few steps forwards, forward by realizing that some of the mistakes we are making, we don't need to make. They're just stupid mistakes. Um, and, and correcting those is, is the name of the game right now. The name of the game now is, is it's repairing the damage that is unnecessary. Um, but the ignorance that is necessary in the sense that it's not contingent, uh, it, we just, we haven't gone anywhere near the point where we can wrap our heads around some of this stuff like time. Um, we haven't got a chance today and people in the future will know that. And then they will feel compassion for us, uh, I think. They'll look back and, oh my God, what must it have been like to be alive in those times? Think how we think of people in the Middle Ages. You know, if you go to one of these, uh, in, in Europe, you have a lot of those places where people live like they used to live in the Middle Ages. And you can visit those places where people live for six months as if it were the Middle Ages or the Bronze Age. Um, and, and, you, and you experience that and you go like, my God, how could these people live like this? Um, people in the future will be looking back at us right now and going like, oh my God, <laughs> how could they bear that kind of situation? Uh, wait and see, you'll be around and you will look back and you, that's exactly what you would think. <laughs> yeah, so last, last question, which I think might be a nice uh a nice one to end on is just your sense of um because we've had this beautiful dialogue with rupert and yourself uh and the sense that you feel like you prepare a lot of people um to be more open to what rupert proposes as a direct experience uh, but rupert also sees the value in your work as like even if you've gone so far in this direct approach the mind will still bring up objections and it's useful to have very rigorously thought out um ways out of that self-created maze um I'm just curious because obviously you have that direct daily uh, contact with the science world and scientists and uh, and the people that that interact with your work. To what extent do you see that happening? How many scientists out there, so, you know, are maybe clicking on Rupert Spira's side or similar oh. things that wouldn't have without exposure to your work? Or um, yeah, it'd just be great to hear what what's happening out there that you notice. Um, the the outspoken um, people, the, the spokespeople of science. And they are not spokespeople of science at all. Most of them tend, tend to be spokespeople of scientism, which is something else. It's the, the attempt to turn science into metaphysics, which is not what it is. And it cannot be that. Its methods are not suitable for science to be a metaphysics. But uh, those spokespeople uh, of, of scientism, I, I'm not trying to open them up. They, it, it's impossible. They, they are fully committed, publicly committed. Um, they are in a mental space where, you know, if you're a Buddhist, it will take a few more incarnations. Uh, uh, th 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 there is no chance of, of them opening up. Um, I interact with them, not for their sake, but for the sake of the audience. 
the silent audience. Um, now, actual scientists who are doing, you know, the hard work of theoretical and experimental science every day. Uh, I wish I could tell you names. I wish I could tell you all the names of the people who want to talk in private to me and what they tell me when they are talking private to me. Um, but I'm asked not to. So uh, what I can tell you is that uh, there is a massive movement happening, um, which is not visible because one, people are genuinely cautious. Now, a major changing worldview is not something that you commit to immediately. Even if you already see it, you will give yourself some five to 10 years. That's what I gave myself uh, before you say, you know what, this is it. I'm not going to change my mind next month because it's been five or 10 years. I, I gave myself over 10 years. I gave myself 12 years. Um, but a lot of them are there right now, right now. And, uh, and with some of them, the level of enthusiasm is moving. It's just moving. Um, there, there, there is a tectonic shift happening. It's just on the ground. Hang around another 10 or 15 years. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, I plan to. So <laughs> I can imagine many of the people I see nodding are as well. And um, just thank you again. It, it doesn't feel like for you the first week um, we met last week just so we could go into breakout rooms and if anyone wants to stick around and reflect on on what you've heard today then we can open some breakout rooms and feel free to share your thoughts and feelings so far and I'm just looking forward to the next three weeks as always Bernardo and, and yeah, I'm many. looking forward to it too it's not going to be as good as today without Rupert but uh, hey we'll, we'll make the best we can <laughs> <laughs> well I, I've always I've always experienced your um, presentations as experiential, dis despite you insisting that they're not. So um, l let's see. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey, Amir, thanks a lot for all this work you've been doing. I appreciate Thank it. you, Bernardo. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bernardo. Thanks for being there. Thanks, Thank you so much, Bernardo. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, See you next week. Thank you. Thank Amir. you, Bernardo. Thanks, Amir. Thanks, Bernardo. Thanks, Amir. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Thanks,